Welcome back to Sunrise today, where we turn away from politics to other matters now. And Professor uh, Eugene Mojiku joins us. He's a structural engineer. Uh, thank you for coming on this morning. Thank you for having uh, me. I'm sure you must have caught some part of the uh, political discussions to see uh, what's going on in policy here. I did, and I hope this discussion won't be as contentious. So <laughs> <laughs> I did. It was, uh, it was quite enlightening. Yeah, I was speaking about which, I mean, uh, at the time we had uh, some of these matters pop up, buildings collapse here, there. There were those who asked uh, a lot of questions. But you, uh, looking through uh, what you've done and uh, how you've achieved what you've achieved, you must have a lot to share with Nigerians in terms of um, how do we begin to correct some of these structural defects, especially when they tell you, look, the, the, the challenge is huge. It's not just when you get to the building sites. Some even use the word systemic. You know, <clears throat> unfortunately, we only have 30 minutes to talk about this, which we can, it, it could be a subject we can discuss for the next three weeks. But having said that, you know, the, the, the process from conception to final construction, the completion of a project <clears throat> is quite involved. And each step of that process must be done properly or you could have problems. And one of the uh, first things that my professor told me when I went to university was, as a structural engineer, you do not have a second chance to do it right. So you can only do it right once. I'll quickly describe the process to you just so you understand what the things that can go wrong. Uh, it starts with the design process where the owner has decided to build something based on a grid master plan. It goes to an architect. The architect uh, designs the building, um, creates the form to fit the function of the building. And then he brings in his consultants, the structural engineers, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, landscape, and so on and so forth. We, the structural engineers, uh, make sure that the uh, building is able to withstand all of the loads that is, is expected to carry, gravity loads and lateral loads from wind and earthquake or what have you. Now, our, our, uh, we, the way we perform function is this, we perform calculations, detailed structural calculations, and those calculations are Transfer, uh, transfer to drawings, so we draw exactly what we want, we specify what we want. The drawings and calculations that are supposed to go to the municipality who is supposed to review what we have done. And by the way, those drawings and calculations should be performed by someone who is very experienced, either by, uh, actually by training, um, uh, school, and practical experience. So the municipality reviews these drawings uh, if the reviewer agrees what we've done, they will approve it. If not, they will send comments back. And personally, I, um, um, I, I love receiving comments from, uh, from my peers because no one is infallible. You can easily make mistakes and like with structures. If you make mistakes in calculations, you can kill a lot of people. So after this process uh, is completed, then it goes to construction. Now in the construction process, the contractors must use what we specified. They must build this in a, strictly in accordance with those drawings. They cannot deviate from what we specified without getting the blessing of the structural engineer. But what you have going on now is sometimes people may add additional flaw to a building that's already been designed and approved. You cannot do that because there's so many elements that can go wrong. For instance, the columns, uh, that's what you call pillars, are meant to support a certain amount of wood. If you add two more, you know, a floor or additional flaws on it, you can overload those things. And when a column fails, you know, that's disastrous. It can be very catastrophic. Also, the foundation is designed to carry a certain amount of load. So you cannot keep adding uh, things beyond what a structural unit has calculated. What if they had designed the foundation to carry, say, uh, three story, and what they have is two at the moment? Mm -hmm. So would that be uh, OK if they yes. add one more? If they, if they designed it to carry three? Yeah. yeah. If the engineer, a structural engineer knows that there's possibility for future expansion, that they can design the elements to be able to accommodate that future expansion. But the right, should, right from the start. Right from the start. It's designed into it, it's <coughs> built that way. So when this addition when this addition is made, then the elements are there to support this addition. But people do it uh, unilaterally without consulting with structural engineer. And so there's no way for anyone to know what the building is designed for except the structural engineer who designed it. You know, for instance, we've seen some buildings uh, being restructured. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe ordinarily it used to be uh, maybe a warehouse and you decided to uh, make use of it uh, maybe as a residential building, maybe right. two, three, four floors. You know, and we have also seen 
a typology of such in Lagos and other places, a bungalow or a story building, and you had to put like four or five more floors on it. Right. What happens if you're a structural engineer and you're called upon to come you know, access or look at some of these buildings before uh, they embark on such a kind of restructuring? Well, the process is quite simple. Um, um, what, what you're referring to is called adaptive reuse. In other words, you have a building that's designed for something, then you want to reuse it for something else. What a structural engineer would do is, one, look at the drawings of the building. You go back to the drawings? You go back to the original drawings if you can find them. You can work backwards to see what those uh, elements were designed for. Failing that, or quite frankly, in addition to that, you would actually do an assessment. You go to the building, assess the building. For instance, in more advanced societies, if you have, uh, say, a foundation, let's take a very simple foundation, uh, what they call a spread foot in the square, it's concrete pad with reinforcing steel in it. If you don't have the drawings, there are non-destructive ways we can determine what the reinforcing steel is inside those uh, footings. We can measure them. We can actually do non-destructive testing to see what the strength of the concrete is. So knowing this and armed with this information, and of course information pertaining to other elements of the building like the beams, the slabs, the columns, and what have you, armed with this, I can now say, okay, to the architect, what do you want to do? How do you want to uh, retrofit or, or, or change this building? It tells me, then I start doing calculations. And my calculations will tell me if the elements that are there are sufficient for the additional loads. If they are not, I can design reinforcement to elements that need it. So you just don't do this blindly. You do it with careful, uh, you know. You know, I ask a question, I ask, uh, sorry Mark, I ask a question because I'm trying to see why we have so many buildings going down. Right. And we have seen that most of those that have gone down were those where they were being reused or added floors uh, on them. What can you say is responsible even in cases where maybe we had a structural engineer who was also consulted. Right. Well, let me say this. I, I, I can't, you know, talk about particular projects that I don't know about. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite quotes is, he who thinks he has all the answers must not be aware of all the questions. So there are many questions to every problem you can come up with. But I can tell you, I described the process. A lot of things can go wrong, and it can happen at any one of those steps in the design process. If the engineer makes a fatal error that no one you know, catches, for example, if you say 2 plus 2 makes a mistake and calls it 16, and he bases his specifications or drawings on this wrong number, that's an error. If no one catches it through the process, it could get translated into a building construction. It could result in, in a catastrophe. Now, the second process in where I talked about the drawings being reviewed by the municipality is really meant to catch such errors. The third uh, part of this process, which is construction, is really where a lot of the mistakes can be made. Let's take, for instance, concrete. You know, concrete is a composite material. Concrete is made of cement, water, sand, and I call it sand. It's called fine aggregates or gravel or coarse aggregates. Each of those four components is really essential for making good concrete. I'll give you an example. Cement in of itself, if you add water to it, it's a process called hydration. That's how cement becomes paste that binds all the aggregates to mix the mass that's, that's concrete. The strength of concrete depends on how much water you add in, this, in, 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 in the concrete. You know, I'll give you an analogy. If you add too much water, that's mean water don't pass Gary. If you don't add enough water, Gary don't pass water. So you have to have the right amount of uh, water in the cement or in the concrete mix for hydration to be complete. If you have too much, once you pass that point, if you have to add too much, the strength of the concrete starts to take a nosedive. So during construction, those things should be monitored. There should be tests conducted on the material before they're installed. There should be somebody who's qualified watching those things. So in, like I say, more advanced societies, these things are really carefully taken care of during construction. Because if you ignore it, anything can go wrong. I just come in and I saw a building that's being built here. Um, you, you can clearly see the columns. And you can see the reinforcing steel sticking up. If you look closely there, 
ties that's used to hold those vertical bars, right? No, the quick um, uh, thing on columns. When you load a column, part of the load goes into the concrete itself. The other part of it goes into those reinforcing bars. It's a very elementary des description. If you think of a reinforcing steel bar, it's very, if it's very skinny, it's a very tiny bar. If you load it, right, what do you think will happen to it? It'll buckle. So those ties that we put on it, those things that hold it together, it's meant to keep the length of it short enough such that it can carry that load. But the, if, if the contractor decides, if the engineer says, look, space those things at 12 inches apart, and the contractor, because he wants to save money, spaces at that six inches apart, he's defeated the purpose. So that, something as simple as that could lead to a collapse. Something as simple as having too much water in your concrete uh, mix can lead to collapse. Something as simple as not placing the reinforcing steel where the structural engineer says to place it can lead to a collapse. So who well, does the monitoring? Who does? It should be. And that's where it should, it should be monitored during construction. It should be somebody qualified to monitor the construction. It should be a testing agency. In some cases, the structural engineer visits the site to monitor the construction. But, you know, it's really not his job to do a continuous inspection. So I believe that we should have in this country a requirement, particularly for very uh, sensitive buildings, where there has to be a qualified testing agency on site to monitor the placement of the reinforcing steel, to monitor the concrete mix, and how it's produced and how it's placed and how it's compacted. Even how you cure the concrete matters 